Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, you are now tuned into the Prince of Investment, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado, via the also beautiful city and state of Honolulu, Hawaii. If you haven't done so already, ladies and gentlemen, please go ahead and make sure you hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. And as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. As you can see in the topic today, bear market. You've seen the markets all over the place, especially the last couple months, right? Has many people thinking of, what should I do now? You're logging into that portfolio. If you got a bullish portfolio, you know, you're watching your portfolio go down. And you're seeing those management fees being paid. In some cases, if you have management fees, well, even if you own ETS, mutual funds, you have some type of management fees, right? And you're wondering, man, what's going on? What's happening? What can I do? So without further ado, I brought in a great uh friend of mine that I met here. He's one of the Investopedia Top 100 2023 Top Financial Advisors uh, by Investopedia. Met him in Huntington Beach, who was at the cocktail hour. And we have Co uh, Colin Overwick. He is the CEO and founder, he's 30 years old, to the CEO and founder of his own firm. He has called Advise. And we're glad to have him on today. So we're going to talk about some good stuff. So y'all tune in. You know, he's a certified financial planner as well. So you're definitely going to get some good stuff today. So without further ado, Kyle, how's it going today, sir? Hey, better than I deserve, Prince. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Definitely, definitely glad. Kyle, where are you at right now? You're in Detroit or you're in California? So if you hit me up any time of the last uh, four years, would have been in Los Angeles, but recently moved back home to uh, the home state of Michigan, just outside of Detroit. Uh, we are welcoming our first baby here, November 19. So right around the corner, we had to get some support from mom and dad. You know how it is. Nice, nice. You know, that's a big jump from California to Detroit. I would say that, you know. <laughs> Especially this time of year, man. I mean, oh, the, the leaves are oh. changing. It's beautiful. But I mean, I got my sweatshirt on, sweatpants. I mean, it's uh, it's cold out there. Okay. So, Colin. You know, tell people about you, people who maybe have never heard you or never seen you. Tell us more about you. Who are you? Yeah, so I uh, studied, studied at Michigan State University, finance, graduated, started working at the big broker dealers, managing millions of dollars for hundreds of clients, and uh, just really wanted to be able to kind of serve a demographic that maybe wasn't as uh, prevalent in just the traditional wealth management space. I mean, the, the firm I worked for uh, had a lot of times million dollar up minimums so really looking for that more retiree client and a lot of my friends maybe had high incomes didn't know how to save build wealth so i wanted to be able to pivot and and serve that demographic that uh, uh represented myself a little bit more getting married starting businesses lots of fun things lots of complexities going on but uh really wasn't maybe didn't have the assets yet so i uh, start launched my own ria uh, after working in the broker dealer space for four or five years in 2018 uh, my firm, Advised Wealth Management, is 100% virtual, so I can be in Michigan, I can be in Los Angeles, I have clients across the country, and we're hopping on Zooms, and I just have the, the, the rule here that if we meet in person, we're having fun, we're not talking about business, we save business for the Zoom calls. Nice, that's, that's pretty good. So people out there who don't know what an RIA is, what is an RIA? Yeah, so RIA is just a fancy acronym for Registered Investment Advisory Firm. Um, it's just a type of firm that uh, may be different from maybe broker dealers. Um, it really just kind of focuses mainly on giving advice. We don't have any products to offer. So I don't sell any products. I don't receive any commissions, um, which in some cases, you know, I'm still making recommendations that people go out and get products. People need their life insurance. They need disability insurance in many cases. But uh, I'm just not being uh, the one compensated for that. And uh, the idea is that I'm going to have less conflicts of interest. And I'm just out here trying to give advice to folks. Okay. Do you manage any assets, you know, itself in your RA? I do manage assets. Um, probably about half my clients have assets with me. The other half either have money kind of locked up in that 401k or some type of employer sponsored pl plan. Um, so then uh, the other half of clients just simply pay flat fees. Okay. Now I have a question for you, right? Yep. Um, you know, you're managing portfolios, you got your clients. Um, I don't know your sentiment on the market, but you've seen these last couple months, you know, from January to June, you're like, okay, things are looking mm -hmm. better. 
out of 2022, you're like, okay, things are looking better. Because it was these big, the end of the year, beginning of the year, it was these big recession talks. But the market was saying otherwise. And all of a sudden, right about that summertime, you know, I thought it was going to be a warm summer, but it started to chill off. The market has been going down, especially very choppy, sideways, up one day, down one day. What is your feeling about this current market? Prince, it's difficult for investors out there, man. I mean, the last two years has been really rough. And honestly, we could even extend it to the last three because now we can bring in the 30% drop that we experienced with COVID. And really, it's just been a roller coaster ever since. We're really down harsh and then we're up harsh. And the last year and a half, it's just been kind of flat, like you mentioned. Uh, we uh, started started off the year great, which is really odd just in and of itself because we had CEOs, uh, you know, like Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, I mean, largest bank in the world, or at least one of them saying that we are headed for a recession. And we have CEOs like Elon Musk agreeing we are headed for a recession. And that is kind of how we started 2023 with that just sentiment in the air. And what has happened is we've just experienced this kind of ex uh, melt upward in the market where everyone is just like looking at each other going, all right, who's gonna blink first? When is this shoe gonna drop? But the labor market has just been so darn supportive of this economy. People are keeping their jobs, they're still spending. And maybe this is just a little bit of that tailwind of what we're experiencing with some of that COVID money where we're helicoptering money and a federal government was, you know, we saw the, the, the burr of the printing machine, uh, all the memes there with uh, the Federal Reserve. And uh, maybe that's what's kind of hanging on. But to your point, the last couple months, it sounds like maybe it's starting to, to come to fruition. We're seeing some other markets starting to experience that already. Um, so it's kind of one of those times to buckle up the seatbelt and maybe get ready for some additional volatility heading into the rest of the year and, and probably early next year as well. Okay, so right now, if you were designing a portfolio for the next six months, what do you got to say? Are you, you going to be bullish? Are you going to be bearish? Are you going to sit on the sidelines? What are you doing, Colin? Yeah, so that's the hardest timeline to be investing, right? When I'm usually giving investment advice, I actually kind of refer to it as stair steps. And I try to create like this visual of climbing up the stairs and it's based on time horizons. And the longer your time horizon, the more return you can demand on your money. And the reason for that is, is because if you invest in the stock market, and this is good for your listeners to hear is if you invest in the stock market on a day-to-day -day basis, you got like a 51%, call it a 50% chance of winning. It's a coin flip. You might as well go down to Vegas. People that really think of investing like gambling. And when you're investing on a day-to-day -day basis, I kind of agree. It is like gambling. But if you expand that to a one year, I don't care if you're talking 1920s or the 30s or one, just one year for the last 100 years, you now have about a 70% chance of being positive in the stock market. And if you expand that to a five-year period, any five-year period for the last 100 years, you're talking like a 95% chance of success in the stock market of having more money than you started with. And Prince, you can kind of see where I'm going with this. The longer your time horizon, the higher probability you have of success all the way until you get to a point where you have literally never lost money in the stock market, assuming that you stayed diversified. You know, you're not just embedding all of your assets on one company. So to bring this all home to answer your question, when I'm kind of breaking this down into time horizons, I'm going, all right, I got my first bucket, my one to two year bucket, maybe my three to 10, maybe three to eight year bucket. And then, if, and then I got my 10 year plus money. That's my third stair step. That's where I can go demand the most return on my capital. We're focusing on the short term. I'm telling you what, right now, cash and cash equivalents, money market accounts, treasury bonds, it's not a terrible place to be. I mean, we're talking like five, five and a half percent. We haven't seen rates like this in a long time, man. And it feels good to get some return on my cash. That's where I'm telling my clients to go is get those high yield savings, get those treasury bonds and say thank you for the free five percent. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's the other side of it, right? People love to talk about these interest rates, you know, 
every time you turn around, Jerome Powell is coming out saying, hey, inflation is bad and blah, blah, blah. Then you have the scary story of Paul Volcker back in the 80s, what he did to interest rates coming out of the coming out of the 70s, going into the 80s, pretty much just ran us into a recession. But people are becoming scared. What are the positives of a high interest rate society? You know, everybody's saying, man, look at these mortgages. Mortgage, mortgages are going up. You're saying stock market is going down, things like that. What are some positives that you could think of of having taken advantage of these high interest rates. Well, yeah, that's that's kind of the first one is that finally your cash is worth something. And and it's it's tough for people out there because not everyone sees it that way. You know, maybe you and I have some clients that have big piles of cash and they're like, well, I don't know what to do with it. It's my emergency fund. And we're like, well put it in cash. You're getting five, five and a half percent. There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually pretty darn good. But if you're on the other side of the fence saying, I want to buy a home, I need to buy a car, I need to get a loan, well, now you're really getting hurt out there and you're paying maybe six, seven, eight, nine percent on some of these rates. And gosh, that home that you thought that you were going to afford that you were saving up for so diligently, like every advisor told you to do, well, shoot, now the mortgage isn't affordable and you're out of the loop. So it just really is a tough environment depending on which side of the fence you're on. Um, but the positives is definitely the yield. You're getting something for your cash. You don't have to go out and watch your stock market portfolio look like a heartbeat monitor. You can get a guaranteed FDIC insured 4.7, call it 5% rate of return. That's definitely something to uh, to get excited about, at least in the current market. That's a very good, uh, very good advice there. Now, ask yourself this question. Um, so if you're someone, you was very bullish in the market. You know, the market took off February. You're like, wow, I'm getting some returns. The market is back now. So you became bullish, maybe a little bit too bullish. Now, come around, you know, now we're looking at October. It's getting pretty cold. What do you say? Do you just say stay put? Would you just liquidate and run the cash? What would you do in that scenario? Well, Prince, we got to go back to our stair steps, man. We got to talk about when do you need the cash? Yeah. If you need the cash in the next two years, we know the best decision. We can't get too risky in the stock market. That's gambling. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can get risky here and there. I'm all about taking a couple bets here and there, small percentages of the portfolio, perhaps. But the backbone of the portfolio, the backbone of your wealth building, it's got to be based on those time horizons. So even though the market's getting cold, even though we're down, what is it, two and a half percent over the last five trading days? That's scary. That's scary stuff right there. Mm -hmm. Even though that's that's happening, if you don't need that money for five, 10, 15 years plus, what's going to get you the best rate of return? Running for the hills and getting that five percent guaranteed, which isn't necessarily guaranteed tomorrow. We know interest rates can drop and then those yields are going down with it. Or is the stock market. Well, historically speaking, evidence tells us you're probably going to do better over a 5, 10, 15 year period holding on to those equities. So we got to kind of let history guide us. That's obviously no guarantee of future returns. But if I'm uh, trying to, to be a betting person, I'm trying to give myself the best opportunity for growth. That's what I'm telling my clients is we got to stick to those, stick to our guns and stick to the plan. Okay. Well, now you're seeing people you know, over the last year, you heard this terminology, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure you probably dealt with it in some capital capacity. People are now saying, hey, is this the perfect time? And what are your thoughts and feelings on cryptocurrencies? Oh, that's kind of like a, an old forgotten tale, it seems like, right? It's like only two years ago, it was like all right. the craze. And now it's like, oh, crypto's old AI is in. Yep. And it, it's so funny how the shiny object just continues to change. Um, and I think that's probably the bigger important lesson is that uh, us as humans, we are designed to try to do whatever we can to, to better ourselves. And as investors, sometimes that actually ends up being the wrong thing to do. Um, similar to when you feel scared, probably not selling, probably hanging on is the best thing to do, even though your gut instincts are telling you to get out and sell. So crypto, man, um, to be honest with you, I own a fair share, less than 5% of my overall portfolio, but it is a, a definitely a material position. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of the, the main names in, in Bitcoin, mainly just because a lot of folks who uh, I look up to and 
who I believe to be smarter than I am are excited about that space. But I could kind of almost see, I'm glad that Bitcoin and, and the cryptocurrencies are out of the news because that kind of, it feels like a lot of the, the silliness is out of it. And maybe cryptocurrencies could be started to take a little more serious. Uh, maybe we can see that market cap of Bitcoin continue to, to slowly edge upward. Um, I believe there's another halving process sometime next year. I'm no expert in crypto, um, but uh, I do believe in it to the extent that I want to at least have my, I want to throw my hat in the ring and have a small position. I tell people all the time, I feel as though it's like a, a lottery ticket. I'm like, hey, these little lottery tickets, um, I go into the gas station, I stretch off. If I win, I tell everybody how smart I am. How much of a genius I am. If I lose, I put it in a trash can, act like it never happened. So, <laughs> so I, go, I tell people that that's my philosophy because I look at it when you look at it as an investment, it's like, well, how can I really make it an investment where I don't know where these things are coming from, who's reporting this information, unregistered, you know, things like that. So uh, that's like my kind of take on it. But I definitely want to get your take on that. Now, Kyle, it's something that we always heard that was a sure, uh, for sure win over the last, you know, forever. You always heard your great grandparents say this. Everybody always said this. It wasn't until 2008 people started to say a little different. People always said, hey, get a rental property. You know, uh, I think it was Fannie Mac put out that they're doing 5% down and you could get a multiple unit apartment, right? Mm -hmm. you know, so people are getting multiple, uh, you know, duplexes, apartments, whatever. It's only 5% down. But we also seeing that the rental market could possibly be oversaturated because one of the one of the downsides is um, as interest rates go up, it means that mortgages going up and when mortgages go up, it leaves a little bit more room for people to charge for rent. So we're seeing these rent prices go up as well. When you look at it, this rentals market, is it a hot market? Is it a dry market? What do you think about that? Buy a house, rent it out a really good question. I get this question a lot from clients, whether they're um, trying to find a, a place to diversify from just their stock and bond portfolios, or maybe they are buying a new house and are still hanging on to that old interest rate at 3%. And they're like, I just can't get rid of it. It just seems like such an opportunity. It's, I think that, that, that it's a tough thing to say, and it's really depends on the individual because um, if you buy, if you get a property manager, a lot of your margin can be extinguished, as you know. Um, and if we look at single family homes, just purely as an asset class, you know, if we're thinking Bitcoin as an asset class, um, you know, large cap U.S. stocks as an asset class, bonds are an asset, single family homes being an asset class. Well, uh, Nobel Prize winner Bob Schiller did a great job putting together the Schiller Index for us, showing us what individual home price sales have looked like for the, the last 50 years. And we've shown that single family homes grow at about four and a half percent. So when you're looking for a place where to go with your cash, with your with your capital, do you want the stock market yielding around eight, nine, 10% annualized rate of return or your single family, single family home at four and a half? Well, that doesn't tell the whole story because maybe you're gonna be receiving some additional cash flow um, maybe you're positive month over month and, and you're actually cash flowing on the property. Maybe you have a low interest rate mortgage and you actually have a little bit of leverage there. So that can kind of juice those returns a little bit. It becomes a complicated uh, answer and, and a complicated question pretty quickly. But I think the biggest thing that I encourage folks to think about is, are they actually diversifying here? And do they also potentially want to have a part-time job? Passive income, I think, is a very uh, obscure term for rental income because when you're getting a phone call at two in the morning that the toilet is flooding or the gutters are flooding or the roof is flooding or something is breaking, it doesn't feel very passive anymore. Mm -hmm. Now it feels pretty active. You got to be calling uh, either contractors and doing that work yourself or you're hiring it out and then say goodbye to your margins. And also you always have the, the individual risk of a client not paying. We've all heard those stories before where a tenant says, hey, I lost my job and I'm not paying this month. Well, 
Good luck taking them to small claims court, kicking them out. If you're in the beautiful state of California where I've been for the last four years and uh, having clients that have rental properties, there's really, really strict tenant laws and they might be able to legally stay there for two, three, four, in some cases, six months before you can actually evict them. Mm. So we got to be, you know, and now all of a sudden, if you're expecting that cash to pay the mortgage, but you're not receiving that rental income anymore, you could find yourself in a really tough situation. So I kind of preface that with, you know, make sure that you run the numbers, make sure you got a, a good emergency fund and you could absolutely get better returns than the market, but you also are taking some additional risk. So is that additional return worth it? A lot of times if the market's getting you eight or 9% and you don't have to do anything and your rental property's getting you eight or 9%, but you have all this additional risk, gosh, was that really worth it? Hmm. But if your rental can get you 13, 14, 15%, okay, well then that juice might be worth the squeeze. Okay. Now someone asks you the question, they look back and they say, well, you know, Real estate seems to be a little tough right now, you know, messing with the margins. Uh, when you're watching, for prime example, if you have to go spend, you know, 10 grand to go, I don't know, get a new roof or something like that, that could knock out, and just if you was only making 100 bucks, 200 bucks a month, that knocked out five years of margin just fixing one thing. You know, hopefully you can get some equity on the other end, but if not, then it's like, was it really worth it? So the other thing I want to ask you, people are like, hey, you know what? Kind of like, I remember this feeling in 08. 08, I was 24 years old. Felt like the end of the world was happening, you know. We was in Afghanistan and Iraq. You seen Lehman Brothers disappear. You saw uh, Oldman Sachs come to his knees. You saw Ford, General, these big household names, Bank of America. All these companies went into financial stress, right? And people, we start to look for different things. We was like, okay, the stock market is dead. Real estate is dead. What do I do now? So I, I preface that with saying in 2023, People are looking for new ways and different ways. What is a new avenue out there that people are not talking about that you're like, hey, you know what? You know, this might be a place to look into. Gosh, I guess I think one one really, really exciting thing is that the ability to become an entrepreneur for almost no money, very little overhead with fabulous tools. I don't, I don't know if there's ever been a better time. Um, you know, you can hop on TikTok, you can see people, you know, being becoming creators, they can open online stores, they can start advertising and selling products, drop shipping with um, a, a really, really simple website that they can put together in 5, 10, 15 minutes, click and dragging and dropping, writing things out. I think it's a really exciting time for people that want to change things up, they have some spare time to get out there, become an entrepreneur. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, you know, get a second mortgage on your house and you have to take this substantial risk. You could start with as little as 50 bucks, 100 bucks, open your first store, start making some sales, have some fun with it and do whatever you're interested in. So if you become interested in, I mean, a silly thing, making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, maybe you become like the tester of all these different peanut butters and jellies and you're selling them on your online store and you could just print your own sticker slap it on some uh, a product and you can become the peanut butter and jelly person you know as a silly example i think the opportunities are endless out there for someone who's a go-getter and creative okay now i gotta answer this question right you lost everything today you know now you've gone off to school and went off to the you know graduated worked at some big brokers now you got your own firm doing your thing moving around from California to Michigan and hanging out, welcome home to new baby, you know, married. What if you lost everything? You're down to zero. You have mm -hmm. nothing. But someone gave you 10 grand. You have 10 grand, nothing else. What would you do with it? Well, for myself, given that I have a unique skill set in this investment management space, I would definitely pro I would definitely get back into the the financial planning and investment management that I'm in today. Um, but if I were to do something completely different and start from scratch, just to give someone a little bit of perspective here, if you invest ten thousand dollars in say the S and P five hundred, you can double your money every ten years or so. 
So, you know, 10 turns to 20, 20 turns to 40, 40 turns to 80. And the goal is that maybe you can have three, four doublings over your investment lifetime. That's not going to make a difference in this case. So what I'm going to do is invest in human capital. I'm going to invest my invest in myself. Everyone listening here, at least most folks who are working still, um, your number one asset is your income. So if you can go out and grow your income and you can get your some type of additional degree, you can take a course, you can do something to better your ability to earn income, that is going to have exponentially more return than just putting that money in the market. Um, so I think I'm going to be investing in myself to either get some type of uh, education or some type of ability to uh, to produce value and uh, produce income. Okay. You know, that's a, that's a pretty good one, you know, betting on yourself. And that was one um, I, uh, I took that from a podcast that I was on, right? Um, he asked me that question and he said, man, I thought you was going to say something about, you know, put it into this and it's going to flip and turn into this and stuff like that. You know, what do you think you're going to do? So now I want to ask you this question too, before we get out of here, you're 30 years old now, going back to when you was 20 years old, what would you tell yourself? What would you do? What would you tell the 20 year old version about you now that, you know, a decade ago? To follow your curiosity mm. um, and, and just continue staying curious and, and, and uh, whatever that burning passion is. Um, I actually have a, uh, uh, a quote back here that says, uh, true desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you sent beforehand to indicate that it's already yours. So if you have that burning itch, that desire to do something special, that's God's proof to you that you all, that it's already yours. You just have to go out there and do it, go out there and take it. Um, that is a Denzel Washington quote. So I got to make sure I give him credit there. Um, but I'd say follow your curiosity because nothing's going to uh, allow you to work harder and survive those late nights, those blood, sweat, and tear moments if you're doing something that you love. Okay. So out there now, you know, people that are tuned in, listening to you maybe for the first time, hearing this, catching the playback, what do you, how do people get more of you? How do people find you? Yeah, so... Uh, probably my, I mean, I got the website advisewealth.com. That's A D V I Z E wealth.com. Um, otherwise, Colin, uh, hit me up on Instagram, TikTok. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter or, or X. And uh, so you can catch me all over the place. Probably most active on Twitter and, and uh, Instagram, though. Okay. Okay. Is there anything you want to leave the audience out there? Um, stick to the plan. Um, I know that the bear markets are scary out there. But if you don't need money for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you, you know, try to think to yourself, is the market going to be higher or lower 10, 15, 20 years from now? And that is the bet you're making. It's not going to be possible to time the market every little zig and zag. And you don't need to to get extraordinary performance. Okay. Well, Colin, definitely thank you. Nice seeing you again, at least virtually. And uh, glad we was able to get this done. But ladies and gentlemen, and to the next video, podcast, cartoon, book, or whatever else crazy you see me doing around the globe, you guys and girls know my name is Prince Dykes. I'm the Prince of Investing. Peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you.